Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, this is Rebecca Buchanan, host of New Books Network, New Books and Popular Culture. And today I'm here with Kathleen Collins, the author of From Rabbit Ears to the Rabbit Hole, A Life with Television. Kathleen, thanks for being here with me. Sure, thanks for having me. Can you start by talking a little bit about how this book came about? And you talk about it in the book as well, but like, how did this come about? Why did you want to write about sort of your um, relationship with television? I had been writing about TV in a semi-scholarly manner in order to attain the necessary, jump through the necessary hoops to get tenure and promotion as a faculty member. And um, I was finished with that <laughs> in more ways than one. You know, I achieved what I needed to achieve, and I really wanted to continue writing about television. And I wanted to kind of reward myself by being able to write about it in a voice that was more my own, um, in a more entertaining manner, and just really to indulge myself and, and continue looking at TV and how it shaped my life. And as one friend really aptly described the book, it's kind of a combination of memoir and cultural meditation, uh, which I think is really a good description because it isn't just a straightforward memoir. I don't feel quite comfortable calling it that, but I still continue to be a little bit analytical about television. I just write in kind of a, you know, a more humorous, uh, a humorous, um, you know, tone. And I also really wanted to sort of thank TV for helping me in a very unexpected way to get through those hoops of uh, tenure and promotion because it wasn't something I had expected to happen. I got a job as a faculty, as an academic librarian, and part of that is going through the motions that any faculty member does, which is publish or perish. And I really was quite nervous about that, not not having a PhD. I, I didn't really speak in that language. And I was quite unsure about how to go about getting published in scholarly journals. And so I started out tentatively writing about TV related things um, and and archives and librarianship and trying to you know pass muster and it turns out that well it, you know it it is certainly a, a field of study a legitimate field of study television studies so I got more confident as I went along and it really surprised myself that I could continue embracing this thing that I had enjoyed so much my entire life and making it work for me in the academic realm as well. So the book is really, uh, uh, as I said, kind of a self-indulgent endeavor, but also a love letter to television too. Yes. With um, no subtitles or uh, footnotes uh, throughout, which, or subheadings, I guess I should say, right? throughout. Uh, when you, uh, can you sort of start, so you did this interesting thing. It isn't, it's this love letter to television. I love that idea of cultural meditation too. I just was like, that's a really great idea, but you don't really, you have shows, you connect to shows, but you're not really bringing up or analyzing specific shows through this. It's more sort of time periods and time frames and, and sort of what television was like and and your interaction with it. So can you sort of set the stage for yourself and television and your sort of introduction to TV and where um, the cultural relationship to television was at that time too? Yeah, that, that's a good way to describe it. It really is more about the time periods than the shows themselves because you might think at first, oh, this is just pretty much going to be a catalog or an encyclopedia of all my favorite shows which I don't know, that, that seems like that would be pretty boring to me. It's much more interesting to see those shows in the con- larger context. So, I mean, I was born in 1965, so I am an old Gen Xer. And um, so I identify a bit with baby boomers, a bit with Gen X. And I'm, I, as much as people poo-poo the whole decadist generational thinking, I. I really believe in it. And, you know, writing this book and having people read it 
and give me feedback makes me realize how strong a connection we have, those of us who grew up on the same kinds of TV shows. And it's really that that captured my interest way back when I was thinking about kind of what what to be when I grow up, which was not as a child, but, you know, in my 20s and early 30s, and I was still trying to figure out what to do. I mean, I watched television as a child. I Growing up in the 60s and 70s, that was just a thing that no one had a problem with. Just watch as much TV as you want, go sit in that room for hours at a time. And I've heard this from other people from my generation, too. It's not, um, it, it was much less frequent to, f- to find parents who would be conscious of letting their children only watch an hour a day or something like that. I'm sure those parents existed, but I didn't know them. They weren't my parents. And so I spent a lot of time watching TV, never thought about it in a meta way, of course, while it was happening. But I began to think about it in a meta way when I was in my 20s. And found a group of people at a place where I worked, a college I worked in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where we all kind of obsessed with Beverly Hills 90210. And it became a, a little social activity uh, to, to get together and watch it. We created a zine and wrote about it. And I just really liked that concept of all these people, uh, you know, coming together about this TV. And I, I give a an incident in the book around that time period where I was in a bookstore and I overheard a conversation of someone trying to recall something from a Brady Bench episode, and I couldn't help but interrupt the conversation and tell him, oh, Do- Dr. Vogel, you're trying to think of the name, you know, and it was like this amazing moment where I I just thought, oh, I just love TV. Look at what it does. It brings people together. And so I just p- pursued that um, first from a journalistic aspect, uh, jur- journalistic perspective. I thought, well, maybe I'll be a TV critic. That seems to be something that brings all of this together. Um, and that, that is what I pursued. At first, I went to journalism school. And, you know, I talk about this in the book. I talk about my whole trajectory career-wise and how that didn't really pan out, although I don't regret any of it. But I ended up in academia and you know, with the same subject matter in academia. So in a way, um, I just went a little bit maybe to the left or to the right of what I had intended to do. Yeah. And and I have to say reading, I love television, but reading your book, I was the one family, I'm a little younger than you, right? 72 is when I was born. So I'm, I'm I'm Gen X or through and through. (laughs) Um, but I was like the one kid whose parents controlled like what we watched on TV, oh. right? Where all my friends got to watch whatever. And I'm like, you get one hour, no cartoons, they're bad for you, that kind of thing. Um, but there were so many, like, we also had the black and white TV. And it wasn't until I got to college where I realized The Wizard of Oz had a whole like color, like, cr- I was like, yes, someone else. But that's, I do feel there's this relationship, like what you're talking about, that whole like, if you've watched this show or if you know that show, I sort of know what kind of, I know who you are. I know what you like, or even if I haven't watched the show, I know what that means. Um, And that was much easier during a time. And you talk about this a little where there weren't a million shows to watch. Right. Right. Um, So can you talk, and you talk a little bit about that transition from everyone um, sort of watching the same thing at the same time or your routine, right? Like creating that television routine um, to now where that television routine is different, right? I don't need to be home. I didn't need to be home on Saturday afternoon to watch Grizzly Adams, right? Because um, I can watch, well, I don't know if I can watch Grizzly Adams anywhere now, but you know, now I could maybe find that somewhere. Right. Right? At least some clips on YouTube. Yes, exactly. Um, but I can tell you, right, what time or what day certain shows were on and you talk about that. So mm-hmm. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more. Yeah, I think I... Just the same way my generation bridged living with and without, without and with the internet. You know, we li- we lived with network TV and then with cable TV and whatever you call this current moment we're in, streaming, streamlandia. I mean, it's it's um it's a really different world. And as you describe, you, it was sort of appointment watching, appointment television. 
back in the 70s and most of the 80s. And it, it, it was all we knew, um, but it, it could present some problems if you weren't available or you had to rush home from something to see Grizzly Adams. You know, it was kind of, uh, uh, it, it, TV was, was more central, the, the, the TV set and the TV schedule was more central to our lives. And in one way, that's lovely that we were all sit, literally sitting around the TV together and watching things at the same time. And there were very many, many fewer options. So the entire nation would be more likely to watch the same TV shows or be witnessing the same galvanizing news events at the same time. Whereas now we're much more atomized and watching things whenever we want on demand. And it's harder to find a lar- be part of that larger conversation. We adapted very quickly, though, however. We can always find people to talk to about whatever show we're watching about. But it, but it is a little bit more divisive, you know. Oh, do you watch Breaking Bad? No. Okay, oh. then I'm moving on. You know, I'll talk to the, this next person. Like, it's, it's less likely that you'll find somebody who has the same Venn diagram <laughs> set of shows. You know, there's a, a smaller intersection area. But, I mean, th- for someone who loves television, this this is a an amazing abundance of content that we have available to us now and such high quality stuff out there that it, it's, it's a little bit hard to pine for the old days. I have to say, I have to say, I love how you talked about binging television about and comparing it to like, I don't read just two pages of a book, right? Like I can, I sit and I'll read a book in a day, or if I really love that book and how we look at the binging of television sometimes is like, Oh, you sat and like, that's like a no, no thing, but it's like, it makes so much sense. So I have to tell you that, that idea of like how we watch television and thinking about it in that way was like, like, I was like, yes, mind blown. <laughs> well, it gives you permission, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, yes, li- this is my, the way I consume literary fodder. So I can treat TV this way. I mean, I think just TV has always had a, a, a poorly reputation, you know, is seen as a mind rotting sort of media. And it, it, it's always hard to shed that. And there's something about sitting in front of a screen for so many hours that people associate with bad behavior and laziness. But, you know, you're not you're not walking around when you're reading a book. You're sitting down when you read a book, too. It's obviously, um, you know, maybe uses more parts of your brain when you read a book or something. I, I can understand that. And I'm not I wouldn't argue that point to the death. But I do think that especially now when we are able to binge shows, I have found that with certain shows, the binging increases the, not only the pleasure, I mean, it's just so fun to just keep going and pressing next, next, but, but it, you sort of metabolize it in a different way. um, And, and can, look at it in a, it's hard to explain, but there, there's some shows that I find that when I binge them, I appreciate them more and I can, I can see the art, the narrative arcs and the character development, you know, much more intensely when I watch it that way. And I think that I've read that some TV creators or content creators do expect the viewers to be watching TV this way and and they think about it. I don't know exactly what they do or don't do differently in creating, but I think binging, at least watching at least a couple things in a row, a couple of episodes seems to be the norm. So that may have changed the way people create and think about their, um, you know, their storyline or something. I don't really know. No, I, I know there are shows, like you said, that if I would have watched them without binging them, I would have given up on. Like, And I think of, one I always talk, think about is Lost. My friends love Lost. They were watching it. I was like, I don't want to watch this. And I finally, I think I was home after I had my first child or whatever. And I was like, fine, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> and I watched like the first four seasons all at once. And right. this 
I'm like, I never would have made it past that smoke monster if I <laughs> didn't know, right? I would have been like, this is dumb stuff. Yeah. But yeah. because I could binge through it, because I knew, and it was like this shortened period of time, I appreciated it in a whole different way that I always wonder. I, I don't think I could, I couldn't have sat through it. Um, but yeah, like, so I find that idea, like that permission to binge, that permission to, you know, do that kind of thing is something we often don't want to give ourselves. Yeah. And that and, that's a perfect example. Your description of why you watch Lost that way. Also, because, you know, you had the time and you, um, might not have had such a chunk of time. So you gave the show a chance. You know, you always hear people saying, oh, you didn't like the first three episodes. It's it's really episode four where it's, things start to gel. And so if you don't make it that far, that's that's a lot to ask of somebody. Sit through three episodes you don't really like that much, but the fourth one's going to change your mind. Often it's really true. But to get people to commit to that is risky. And you talk about throughout, it, you mentioned this a little, that idea of um, how being, writing about television and thinking about television these ways always sort of made you an outcast, right? Like there's always this sort of outcast. You talk about that even in, in returning to New York and, and going to graduate school. So can you talk a little bit about that, that, that idea that television is sort of the, even to film, to, to all art, it's sort of the lesser, it's, it's the bastard child of art kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's, I didn't, uh, I didn't realize it um, again in that in that meta way until I was a little bit older. But I was just so I I didn't care that it it might have bit me it might have been seen as a bastard art or anything because it just um, it was just all I was really interested in. I I never. I never felt drawn towards film studies the way that I was drawn towards television. Um, I don't know. I don't know why that is. I mean, maybe part of me sort of liked the, the outcast, um, you know, low art aspect of TV. So it's something to think about. I mean, I do, I do champion it. So, um, when I, when I went to journalism school, I was part of a, um, a subspecialty called cultural reporting and criticism. And it was the first year that the NYU journalism school had this in their program. And we, I, I tell this story in the book, but we, we went around the table in one of our classes and everyone sort of introduced themselves by describing the thing that they were interested in, whether it was film or music or, or whatever it was. And I was the only person who said television um, and you know, I was sort of proud of that <laughs> being being the only one. And my my professor said said, yeah, that's great because we need more good television writing. And it gave me so much confidence, you know, that somebody I respected said, yeah, it's a thing, and we need more of it. So you go do that. And um, you know, everybody likes talking about TV. I I no matter what, if they if they deny it, they're lying. They can talk about how much they dislike TV and we're still going to have a fabulous conversation. So no, even though I might field of study might be something that seems a little lowbrow, I have no problem having a conversation with anyone about TV. Someone's got something to say about TV and I love that about it. And you bring that up, right? You talk about that idea that it, it doesn't matter, right? Like, it doesn't matter where you're at on that spectrum. You're going to have something to say about it, that there are sort of cultural touchstones throughout what, you know, like you say, whether you watch it or you don't watch it, but it comes back. It brings us back. I really liked um, your connection to sort of the OJ Simpson trial or even the, the um, t like, and it made me kept thinking of the film, the I, Tanya movie, right. But the hard Nancy, hard Tanya, um, uh, I cannot, I'm blanking on her name, but, um, but yes, but 
Here again, thank you. Uh, but that, right, <laughs> we'll get there. But that idea that, yes, like, even if you're like, I can't believe you watch TV, you're going to return to the TV and talk about the TV in those ways. Yeah, that's where our we we see the events of our country, you know, in the world happening is on a TV screen. Um, obviously, people can get their news in other places, but the things that stay with us and and make their way through history are these images from TV um, a, lo- a lot of the time or, or the video clips from TV. So you, it's hard to escape them even if you don't watch TV. Another thing that you bring up throughout, and I think is really important, is the, the object of the TV itself. The TV, like you don't own a TV, right? And the object of the TV set and what that means and, and how that meaning has sort of changed throughout your life. So can you talk a little bit about TV as an object. Yeah, well, the TV, um, the cover of my book, which is a stock photo, but is very close to, or or a stock image, it's quite close to the one that I had growing up in mid-century America. And and it it was with me for a really long time. You know, very typical, big, hot, heavy thing with rabbit ear antennae on the top. And um, uh, just a few channels. And that was, to me, that that's what TV was for most of my life. Maybe they got smaller, um, less wood, more metal, you know, but they were, that, but they were still things that you could put something on top of. And that kind of took up an uncomfortable amount of space in your living room. And I got, in my opinion, uglier as time went on, like more of an eyesore in your living room or your den or wherever. And then and now they're really flat. And, and on a wall or, um, you know, just a small standing screen on, on a surface or something. And you can't put anything on top of them anymore. It's a really different piece of furniture. And also what's on those TV screens is wildly different than what was on that big box. It's funny, isn't it, that the big giant TV had four things on it. And the skinny flat thing has like 4,000 things on it. (laughs) That's technology for you. But I don't have a TV. I haven't had a TV in my home for a dozen years. Um, But it's, I I just don't need it. I watch everything I need on my computer screen. And I don't miss it. It's, (laughs) I have to live in a small apartment. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and that's right. An interesting idea to think about, like my children and I, when we're going to watch something, we have a TV, but half the time we sit on my bed and gather around like the computer to watch like a television show or a movie. Like my son and I, when COVID first started, watch all the Marvel movies in the order they should be watched. <laughs> um and we did it all on the computer, right? Like we could have done it on a big TV. The TV's used for gaming, right? Like it's not used for. Oh, that's interesting. Right? Is it? Is it? Yeah. Um, like, so you associate the TV with games because it's more more pleasurable to play on the large screen. Is that the idea? Yeah, my, yeah, my son uses that for gaming, but I mean, he watches, but he doesn't. I mean, we don't have cable, but we'll have like, but you can watch on, uh, you know cables you can watch you know hulu or whatever on you know on our tv but rarely does anybody use the tv but my husband right like the kids all on their phones like the only thing my son my son has a tv that all he uses it for is gaming because he wants to be yeah so i thought like that idea of like you don't need a tv as an object to still like watch right and how we watch tv and how we consume television or how we consume those kinds of media right then those shows has changed yeah, yeah and um, yet, like you, you're referring to it as tv i'm referring to it as tv and i find it strange that I, it seems like even young people still call things tv shows i i could be wrong i i you know haven't done any study on this but you know people know what we're talking about when we say tv show even if they maybe they call it streaming content or I don't know what other names, there's nothing as convenient as calling it a TV show. And it's something episodic, um, you know, we still call it TV. So I just, I think that's really interesting. Yep. I mean, that's what my kids call it. That's TV. 
or it's their show that they're going to watch, right? But it all is related to that. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. They might label it with whatever genre it might be, but it's still like I'm watching TV, right? Like I'm watching a TV show versus I'm watching a YouTube clip. I can watch a TV show on YouTube, but like it's still a TV show, right? It's still like I'm watching that show, but it's on YouTube, right? Or I'm watching the show on Crunchyroll or whatever, but it's still like, it's not like the content, it's like where it's located, but it's still a T, right? There's very much a distinction between the television show, like those creation of shows versus sort of other forms of content. So we'll see how long that lasts. No, yes, no, I, I'll be really interested to see too and how that changes. I thought it was, I mean, you are much more a fan of comedy as well. Like you sort of talk about that role of, um, comedy in your television viewing and television life. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that and, and how you sort of see that playing out in this um, space for you. I think it ha- it was a combination of the fact that my the people around me, my parents, my grandparents liked sitcoms. So that those were kind of the earliest shows that I was... Um, you know, confronted with. (laughs) Um, And, you know, I don't know if people are just born with certain types of personalities. And I, I always liked funny things and funny people and, and sitcoms are short, kind of colorful, lively things. So as a kid, they appealed to me. And I pretty early on in my life developed a taste for irreverence and, you know, kind of edgy humor, even though I didn't know that's what I was liking at the time, but it just became more and more uh, part of of my bailiwick. You know, I just was always drawn to shows that I thought were funny in in, in a smart, edgy way. And so those are still the, the shows that I'm drawn to today. And, you know, for example, I, di- I don't really, I'm not interested in kind of... Um, family friendly sitcoms they're you know i understand why they exist they they have an important purpose but they're not for me you <laughs> know they have to be a little a little um snarky or something to get my attention and i was always like that because i grew up on norman lear shows those were the shows all in the family um the jeffersons maud um mary tyler moore um you know, that's not Norman Lear, but, but, but that had an edginess to it as well. You know, they were very smart and I watched those shows when I was probably too young to understand a lot of what was going on in them, but they imprinted themselves on me somehow. And, you know, with their, within the seventies, those shows were very keen on putting forth messages about, you know, socially progressive messages, um, feminist messages. And so I really credit those shows to making me who I am in large part because I appreciated them. uh, And I, as I got older, I was able to understand what they were really about. And I still, I still think they're amongst the best shows that have ever been on television. Yeah. I appreciated how you, you know, we often think about how, we're in this really great age. Like, I think there's great television right now, but I appreciated that you reminded me that there was some great television 40 years ago. Right. Like, I'm like, those were really great shows. Like, you you know, in the Bob Newhart show you talked about, but like all, you know, and thinking about um, that idea that we haven't just jumped all of a sudden into great television that we didn't have before. Right. And that it's important to remember and think about. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think, you know, young people always have, um, they always need to be pushed to know that stuff existed before they were born. And so <laughs> a lot of a lot of that stuff got lost. And then there was what, what I think is a relatively fallow period, following all of that great stuff from the 70s, where there wasn't a lot of great TV at all. Um, a lot, a, a lot of really kind of flat, stereotypical characters, not great writing. I mean, there's, a, there are exceptions, but um, the seventies then, you know, you have to wait a couple decades almost until we got into the good 
stuff again. And then you're hitting up against cable and a lot of streaming content. And then there's an explosion. And then now we have so, so much, it's overwhelming. And and I have to, uh, we have to talk about 90210. <laughs> <laughs> because you are like not only with the zine, but you brought up this important fact I thought was really important is that my sister is like five years younger than I was. And when 90210 came out, that was like a show for her age. And I was a little too old for it, but I still loved, right? I still, it's the same with 21 Jump Street. I'm, I, she was like the love of Johnny Depp right now. Now it's a different story, but right. Like, you know, like 30 years ago, 40, 40, 30, 40 years ago, Johnny Depp, you know, and, and all of that. But, um, but that idea of like appreciating a show, even if it's not on the, on the front end made for you, right. Or you are not the target audience and how TV sort of draws that in, in a way. Well, that is exactly the case with me and 90210. I was a few years too old for it as were all of my zine writing friends, but what we did with it was poked fun at it um, and of course enjoyed it. I mean, we were, let's not lie. Like it was a soapy fun thing for us to get addicted to and watch and talk about every week. And, and I, so I think it was that, that, you know, snarky fun poking that was the bond for us. And yeah, we didn't, we didn't, look at it as TV critics, you know, we weren't pointing out, um, oh, this character is drawn well or whatever. It was just all about the character, the content and, um, you know, the storylines and the, the cliffhangers and the drama and all of that. And that's one way to look at television. You know, that's what a lot of people do together. And so, the, and Melrose Place, of course, was part of, you know, they sort of went together. <laughs> and yeah, it was not for me. And maybe it made it a little bit easier to make fun of because of that, because it was not meant for me. I was older and uh, I don't know. It was great fun, though. I have I, I, I really have to say that that I think it was watching 90210 with my friends. This may seem like a stretch, but it's it led me to where I am today. <laughs> oh, but, but that's an, and you, you bring this up and it made me, the 902 reference made me think about like, I always, when I, you know, I work with teenagers and I'll say, you watch Riverdale for those kids on Riverdale. I watch Riverdale for the adults on Riverdale, who, when I was your age were the, you know, like, I'm like, you got Skeech Ulrich, you had, you know, Molly Ringwald's on there. Um, uh, until he passed away uh, from 90210. Who's again? I'm blanking on his name. Um, yeah, um, me too. Dylan. Yeah, yeah, yes, right. <laughs> oh, Luke, but like, Luke, Luke Perry. Luke, yes, Luke Perry. Right, yeah. you have right, and you know, and so you bring up John Travolta and that, like, sort of following John Travolta through that trajectory, yeah. and it made me think about right that, and my relationship with TV has also created a relationship with like. I watch Buffy, so then therefore I have to watch Bones, so therefore I have right like like oh, following yeah. certain people through a right. career, right? And, and being able to see that in a different way on television than you would um, on in film, right? So can you like how do you see? I mean, you talk about that a little, but like, can you talk a little bit about how you might how that sort of plays out for you? Um, you mean with John Travolta specifically or? <laughs> well, not just, uh, well, I mean, you talk about John Travolta and you talk yeah. about Malcolm Jamal Warner, right? Yeah, kind of, but right. Like, how do you see that sort of play well, out? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think those, those characters, um, I mean, it's sort of the crossover idea, right? You see one character on, on one show, um, who, who plays themselves in another show. It, 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 there's something, um, mind bending about it. And, and I sort of had that feeling about seeing the same actors, you know, even if they were, were different characters, seeing the same actors that I had known well in one context put into another one just sort of made me feel even more, um, you know, part of this world of television, you know, th they're like people I know there's, 
John Travolta as Vinnie Barbarino. And there he is as Vincent Vega on the big screen, right, in Pulp Fiction. There he is as um, Robert, whatever his name is, the lawyer in the O.J. <laughs> I can't think of his name, the O.J. lawyer. Yes. <laughs> um, well, yeah, people know who I'm talking about. And and just, you know, the, the, that span of years, so from the 70s through to the 21st century, um, there's the same guy, you know, I don't know. It seems just very, um, it kind of pulls my life together in a way that makes it make sense. <laughs> like almost like he's a family member or, or a good old friend. And there's something very comforting about that as at the same time that it's kind of bittersweet, you know, you see the passage of time so clearly. And there, there are other people, people like that, that I mentioned, like, I couldn't help mentioning that, um, you know, I, I talk about the different kinds of boys that, that I, uh, that appealed to me or, or, or males on TV. Like I always liked kind of the nerdy guys more than the supposedly hot guys. I liked Joel from uh, Joel. What's his name? Joel Fleischman from Northern Exposure. Better than Chris the DJ. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then Chris the DJ, who's supposed to be the hot guy, was also in Sex and the City as Carrie's, you know, hottie boyfriend. And I don't know, just I just couldn't resist making all these different connections between people. And um, I, I mean, that's the thing is everybody who has watched TV throughout their lives has this experience. And and anyone could come up with their own set of people, whether it's Molly Ringwald or whoever, um, Sarah Michelle Geller, whoever the people are, they they mean something to you. They sort of represent something in your life and punctuate the different time periods of your own life. And I just I don't think that should be underestimated or thought of as a silly thing to care about. I think it means something. Yeah, one thing, it was interesting in reading your book, and you mentioned The Cosby Show a couple times, and you, then Malcolm Jamal Warner, and I had just heard him on NPR this past week, <laughs> and The Cosby Show came up yet again, right, and that reference, and, and how he said, it was really interesting, because he said, you know, I base my marriage, my relationship on Cliff and Claire, it's not on bill right like it's it, it's on those two characters and talking about the characters versus the people and how we need to separate that and so i thought that was really interesting and, and you talk about danny bonaducci and i think about danny bonaducci and some other people who were you you know even um recently screech dustin uh, you know from saved by the bell right we have these these people who have sometimes very tragic lives, right? So we see them either growing up or young and how sort of television um, sometimes gets discounted because of the person, right? In ways that other media doesn't. And so can you talk a little bit about sort of that and how you sort of think about and wrestle with that, those ideas? Well, that's interesting about, um, I'm glad to hear Malcolm Jamal Warner said that about Cliff and Claire, because, you know, that's, that's something that we can we can take from a certain show what what we want and and forget about the rest. I mean, I w it would make me sad to think that Malcolm Jamal Ma Warner would would throw away the ideal marriage from that TV show simply because of the of the Bill Cosby scandal. You know, I mean, it still exists in his mind and. So whatever shows we watched when we were young that imprinted themselves on our minds, no matter what happens to the actors, they, again, they mean something to us. And they may be, especially on TV, they may be unrealistic, so, to, you know, they may be idealized, but why not, why not try to hold that as, as a paragon of a, of a happy family or something, knowing, you know, you're never going to achieve it perfectly, but, but it, it's, you know, those things are, we see when we're so young, really give us the idea of the way 
things we want things to be and th- and and certain things appeal to some people and other things <laughs> appeal to other people for example i've been asked a couple times how did you choose the shows that you talked about in the book did you go through tv guide did you did you um you know, research all the shows that were on. No, I basically just went from the top of my head. What shows stuck with me? What, what did, what came to the top of my head when I thought about, you know, my senior year in high school or something. And so to me, it's the shows that jumped out without me having to dig through um, old newspapers that had some sort of influence on me one way or the other. And so I think the Cosby family had a really big impact on a lot of people in a very positive way. And that's great. And I hope people will keep that and get rid of the stuff that they don't want to um, remember or think about. And, you know, that's not a lot of people think that way, but I do. (laughs) Right. And it's a cult, right? There's a cultural importance to that show as well right yes i i you can go i'm sure you can find it i can't remember or i can find it and send you the link but um malcolm jamal warner i think he's a really smart guy i mean he's really smart anyway but the way in which he talked about um that relationship and that show and even showing it to his daughter in these ways like this is a show right these are characters and we have to really separate the characters from otherwise we would never read or watch and we all have different touchstones for that but you know i mean we can find fault with every single person ever exactly Um, so we're trying to like manage that and approach that um so what is this like what do you hope um or or like one of the things that you um talk about a bit is that sort of criticism and critique of tell right you know and, and people not sort of taking tv seriously we've talked about that a little but are there um things that you're hoping that people will start to think about differently around television you know like think differently about television or maybe those like maybe have that they stop and are like oh okay um maybe i didn't give that that's the credit that it deserves um and maybe you weren't trying to get at that but um I mean, I think people are already doing that because the A, there's so much great stuff out there and you you don't have to, you you don't have to convince anyone that TV has some valid artistic, you know, artistic merit. Um, And the other thing is that television criticism is so, has also blossomed so much in the era of streaming content and and it's such good writing you know people take it there's tons of people taking tv seriously and not just in academia you know in the journalistic world and and so it's already happening you know i don't need to convince anyone i think i don't think anyone who doesn't already like tv would be interested in picking up my book so those people aren't, I wouldn't convince them anyway, but if somebody, let's say a friend of mine feels obligated to read my book because she's a good friend, but isn't a big TV watcher, I would hope that she would say, wow, I never realized, you know, that my, my friends who were watching TV all the time really, really got something from it. And that it, it really can, it, it, it wasn't just like eating junk food, you know, it really can shape a person's way of thinking. Um, and, and also boost creativity. I think it's another way of storytelling. And I think people realize that now, I mean, you hear that term storytelling all the time related to TV and, creators say, I'm just a storyteller. I'm just a storyteller. Well, that's right. That's what it is. And you're telling the stories that are universal. And even if on the surface, they don't look like it, it's about our human nature and, and all the craziness that we share. And, and if you, if you look at it that way and really get something out of it, 
then it deserves all the credit that any other film or book does. You know, I think it's, it's extremely valuable and I'm really glad that there's so much good stuff out there now that I think people, it's sort of hitting them in the, their faces that this is the case. Yeah. I it, like it, it often made me when you were talking and also reading, it made me think of um, fan fiction and other ways in which people have continued that narrative or that story or changed it um, to for themselves. Right. It, and how it isn't just this static, um, you talk about the the television show from England where they're you're watching people watch television, right? Or, um, but that idea that it isn't just um, where you're sitting and watching. Like my friends and I will talk about, t- you know, like did you watch this? Have you watched it? Like, and you've talked about this before, but that conversation show it is something where you interact, right? And you're just yeah. not. Yeah, that's a great um, aspect of TV watching that I didn't even touch upon at all, which is fan fiction. Um, and it's because it's a world that I know only a little bit about, but I know it's a very, very robust, uh, you know, endeavor and it's really nice. It's, it's so it, talk about boosting creative creativity. I mean, there's whole, there's whole industries based on Star Trek that have, you know, nothing to do with the original stories. I think it's amazing. And people make their living doing these things sometimes so it's like it's like a starter you know starter dough the show itself and then people just become so pleasantly obsessed with things that they make their own new worlds and can or continue their own favorite worlds and I think it's really cool mm-hmm. so I have to, I'm sure this is probably I'm like I have to ask it anyway what do you have suggestions for TV I know you brought up I mean it's all over but I loved it too my crazy ex-girlfriend which with the title I was like am I gonna watch this and then I read I read some great reviews and I there is the scene I don't know which season it is but the last where she's on the plane and she just has like a breakdown I'm like this is some smart like what and you talk about it like like that idea, like men talking about mental health, talking about addiction, talking about these things like that we need to talk about and we don't talk about it. And the te- you know, these shows are doing that. So, um, yeah, it's yeah. Um, it's it's one of those shows that looks so kind of candy coated on the surface, but is really about serious things and therefore will get people to watch it who might not. um you know, have an outlet or have someone to talk to about their particular issues, like it can actually do good. And um, I mean, there are so many shows that I think are really good. I actually was just pulling up a list because I'm always afraid of this question that I'm going to forget. I figured. I was like, I'm going to ask it anyway. This is not even exhaustive. (laughs) This is just like things that came to my mind. Um, I mean, do you want me to just rattle off a bunch of shows that from this Sure. Go for I it. mean, the, the, these are some, this is, this list came from, from, you know, friends asking me, what should I watch? And that to me is like coming to New York city and saying, where should I eat? You know, I, I don't know. I cannot begin. Like, <laughs> what do you like? What do you, where are you going to be? You know, I can't, it's way too big a question, but I have a, a, a list of about a dozen shows that I'll tell you that I think if you like good, smart TV, these are shows that I've really enjoyed. Nurse Jackie, Call My Agent, The Politician, Better Things, Sex Education, End of the Fucking World, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, Handmaid's Tale, Shit's Creek, Ozark, F is for Family, Dead to Me, Fleabag, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Afterlife, Silicon Valley, and I put Mrs. America on there, even though that was a mini series. Um, those are all relatively recent streaming content things, um, not in any order of preference or chronological <laughs> release. Um, but th- that sort of represents things that I've just loved in the last few years. And I don't have anything at the moment that I'm watching except uh, the show Breeders. That's a British show um, with starring Martin Freeman and someone. Um, but I'm, 
hankering for the return of uh, Handmaid's Tale, which I understand is coming back soon, which falls outside the realm of my my comedy thing. But I do, you know, think that acting and the story is just so wonderful. So I don't only watch comedy and some of the things on that list were not comedy, but most of them are. And I just think great comedy writing to me, if you gave me the choice between a hot fudge sundae and a comedy, well-written comedy, it would be a very difficult choice. They both, they both deliver huge amounts of pleasure to me. Yes. And there's a lot of um, dark comedy that you've got. Um, Jason Bateman, you mentioned Ozarks, and Jason Bateman's one of those that the trajectory of which he's taken, I was so surprised at, but I've been so happy with. Like, I was like, like, I'm like, the I think that um like I think Ozarks is wonderful. I think that um see now I keep blinking on every single show. <laughs> I know what the it's arrested like. development. Arrested yes. development is spot on. Exactly. Like, so. I mean he's he's really I'm also very pleased at his trajectory because he's he can do it all. He's very good at drama and comedy. Um Arrested Development should should be on that list. I just loved that. So irreverent. Yes. Yes. And so sometimes I'm like, you could have gone this like pretty boy kind of, but you did. And his his sister also is writing some really smart stuff about yeah. how she can age gracefully and or not gracefully and it doesn't matter. Um Yeah, so, she's really interesting too. Yeah. Yeah. So that family, I'm I'm good with them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> somebody somebody did something right there. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, so I guess I mean, usually my final question is like because we've been talking for I mean I could talk about TV all day but um, <laughs> Me too. what are you working on anything are you just like taking a break from writing like where are you at like, I'm taking a break in a way I mean I actually uh, wrote a novel I'd never written r- really wrote fiction before I wrote a novel that I finished last summer that I've been unsuccessful in getting published but I'm not going to give up And then I'm experimenting with um, writing sort of a biographical fiction. Um, I I haven't begun yet, but the idea is to write. uh, It it has to do with the humorist James Thurber and his wife, Helen Thurber. So it's going to be something about something in that. So I'm kind of experimenting now with different. I broke out of my academic writing. Mm -hmm. You know, I wrote a memoir. I wrote with a humorous tone. So then I did a novel. Now I'm going to try something different. So now that you've got your, like you said, you got your tenure, your promotion, you can now like experiment all you want. Exactly. I'm a free woman. I'm a free agent. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's been great. Again, this is Kathleen Collins, who's the author of From Rabbit Ears to the Rabbit Hole of Life with Television. Kathleen, thanks so much for talking with me on New Books Network. It's been so fun. Thank you, Rebecca.